From intern to loyal deputy to arch nemesis, Rick Gates is set to face the heat from Paul Manafort's lawyers today as they cross-examine the former Trump campaign aide one day after his potentially devastating testimony. Gates sat in the Alexandria, Virginia courtroom on Monday, speaking quickly and never making eye contact with his former boss as Manafort glared at him from the defense table. Manafort's team will likely paint Gates as an untrustworthy, self-interested character. So let's take a look at just what Rick Gates did and what he said about Manafort's crimes and his own. You gotta remember that, and his own. He's no good guy. Gates said that he hid a total of 15 foreign companies owned by Manafort from the United States government. Companies that Gates said Russian oligarchs paid millions of dollars into, funneling the money into foreign bank accounts controlled by Paul Manafort. Gates did not disclose the accounts to the IRS, a move he said was specifically requested by Manafort. He even kept the accounts secret from Manafort's accountants. And remember, Manafort's attorneys have already blamed the accountants, bookkeepers, and tax preparers. And again, he, Rick Gates is saying it was all Manafort who directed it. The secret offshore accounts and foreign companies were used to make and made wire transfers to Manafort's U.S.-based accounts, with much of the money being treated as loans to push down Manafort's tax liability. Gates also testified that he inflated expense reports, something Manafort's attorneys could seize on as proof the younger man was embezzling from his mentor's businesses. Part of a likely strategy meant to go after the credibility of the star witness. Gates even testified about his own lies. Pay attention to this. Gates lied to the FBI when he was asked about a meeting between Manafort and members of Congress that took place years earlier. A meeting Gates falsely claimed never actually happened. In his testimony, Gates admitted to the lie, but pointed out his plea deal depends on his honesty in court trying to inoculate himself against any challenges from Manafort's defense team today. It's going to be a heavy day. All right, joining me now, retired Navy counterintelligence operator and author of The Plot to Hack America, Malcolm Nance, and my dear friend and MSNBC contributor, former U.S. attorney and senior FBI official Chuck Rosenberg. All right, Charles, to you first. How bad is Gates' testimony for Manafort's case? He is not a credible guy. Well, he's a criminal, uh, Stephanie. He's a criminal, but criminals tend to hang out with other criminals, bank robbers with bank robbers, uh, fraudsters with fraudsters. And so from the perspective of a federal prosecutor, this happens all the time. We put on uh, in evidence uh, conspirators, those who worked with the criminal on trial, and they detail what they themselves did, just as Mr. Gates is doing now. So. Is it important testimony? Absolutely. Is it determinative? Probably not, because remember, this is a paper case, and we have bank records and tax returns uh, that will corroborate what Mr. Gates is saying. This is not good for Mr. Manafort. He hangs out with other criminals. Now we're hearing from one of them. We should also remind our audience, Paul Manafort getting money funneled from Russian oligarchs hiding money from the IRS, hiding money from the U.S. government. And this was the man selected to be the campaign chair for President Trump's campaign. And remember, President Trump loves to say it. He hires only the best people, a guy who is hiding money from the U.S. government. Chuck, I also want to ask you about the judge here, T.S. Ellis. He seems to be giving the prosecutors a really hard time. What do you think that's all about? Well, I was a prosecutor in that courthouse uh, for many years, Stephanie, and I've appeared in front of Judge Ellis many times, and that's what happens. Um, he tends to be, uh, I, I don't, I, I don't, I want to say something nice about him, but I also want to say something truthful. Just tell the truth. Well, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to. Uh, so the best judges are umpires. They call balls and strikes. Uh, Judge Ellis likes to pitch and catch and play shortstop, too. Why? I mean, he, like, he, he interjects himself into cases. He likes to take over questioning. He likes to tell prosecutors and often defense counsel uh, how to best <laughs> frame their arguments or, or um, put on their witnesses. Uh, look, I think he's a good judge. I think he gets to the right place in the end. But uh, sitting through a trial with him, particularly as an advocate, uh, can be torture. 
Okay, but hold on. <laughs> if he's doing this and he's giving the prosecutors a hard time, one could be because he's a showman or a know-it-all, and the other could be because he wants to help the defense because it's the yeah. prosecutor that he seems to be cutting off, not the defense. And even though, yeah. I mean, uh, my, my sense of it is he doesn't really want to help anybody, and I think that would be an unfair characterization. Uh, some, you know, something bugs him that day, and he's on the prosecutors. Something could bug him the next day, and he's on defense counsel. I've seen him do both of those things. I've seen him do both of those things in the same trial. Uh, I think the bottom line is this. The jury is uh, out of the courtroom for some of this. They're not really going to, I think, learn much about one way or the other based on the judge's interjections. In the end, I don't think it really matters. It's just a bit annoying, and you have to put up with it as a prosecutor. Okay, doke. Malcolm, just a minute ago, Rick Gates laid out in court how a Ukrainian businessman paid Manafort for consulting work, and then Manafort hid that money. Walk us through the conflict of interest for Manafort here. Well, the conflict of interest is manifest here. Uh, you know, the, the Manafort was a fixer for dictators. And in this particular instance, working with the Ukrainian government, a pro-Moscow Ukrainian government, he was doing activities, uh, all of which weren't being reported at the time, and where he was getting paid under the table tens of millions of dollars. And all of this eventually would transport itself into the Trump campaign. You know, there were there's reporting that he was actually in, uh, in debt, despite the fact that he was receiving tens of millions of dollars in these activities. And then when he came on as the campaign chair for Donald Trump, he was offering Russian oligarchs access, and no, most notably uh, De uh, Oleg Derek Paska, access to the briefings that he was giving the potential president of the United States. This is, you know, it's a lot bigger than money. And I think that the, the Mueller campaign knows that. What they're doing is there's essentially three trials going on. There's this one, which is Manafort's past, which will eventually lead to a future trial about his relationship with Russia in the future. And then New York State, which is going to guarantee that he gets no pardon on all of the crimes that he's carried out within that state. Chuck, what's the fate of the Mueller investigation if Manafort gets off here? Well, he has another trial in the District of Columbia later this year. First of all, I don't expect him to get off here. This is an exceedingly strong case. But, Stephanie, to your question, if he does, it continues. Acquittals happen. We know that as prosecutors. Mm. I've probably tried 40 or 50 cases. I've had an acquittal or two. All good prosecutors, I think, have. Um, I think politically, and I mean that with a small p, it would be a setback. I think legally it would be um, rather meaningless. I want to ask you guys about Hope Hicks this weekend. Hope Hicks left the administration. She resigned a day after she testified to the House Intel Committee. And I'm sure she was asked about uh, that Trump Tower meeting. Because remember, Hope Hicks was on Air Force One with the president when he misrepresented what that meeting Don Jr. had uh, um, uh, with the Russian lawyer. Hope Hicks now made her way back to Medminster. Supposedly, for old time's sake, uh, she decided uh, to go to this rally in Ohio with the president. And while I wonder if I was going to somebody's weekend house, I'd probably bring tennis clothes, some shorts, and a T-shirt. Alas, she was ready to uh, <laughs> join the president. Could Robert Mueller or House Intel ask to speak with her again if she had one-on-one -on -one time with the president? Given how serious things are about that Trump Tower meeting, how closely tied Hope Hicks is to it, and now she was with the president, did she just walk back into a hornet's nest, Chuck? Uh, yeah, I think so. And by the way, to the extent the president and his team complain about how long this investigation is taking, uh, frankly, they're the ones creating more evidence. The first thing a defense lawyer will tell his or her client is not to talk to any other witnesses. It's a right. strict rule. It makes perfect sense. And so, naturally, I think uh, Mueller's team is going to want to ask her, what did you talk about? Uh, and what did he say? And did he ask you about your testimony and what questions you were asked and what answers you gave? And so uh, it's a mistake for witnesses to speak with one another alone. The conversation, Stephanie, is not privilege. She's not a member of White House staff, so there's no executive privilege. She's not a lawyer, so there's no attorney-client privilege. And you bet uh, prosecutors are going to want to talk to her about it. What do you think, Malcolm? Well, thank God you have Chuck here, because I really thought that was exactly the case. You know, my first thought was, do we have a case of witness tampering going on here? Did the president call her over, bring her on Air Force One, not just for old time's sakes, because you're going to talk about things. And did they talk about what 
Manafort spoke to her about specifically. The big question will be, will she have answered? Well, did she go for her own interests, or is she supporting the president's interests here? And I think that she's probably going to be hauled back in again, because you really need to know, did she tell us the truth the first time, or did she go to the president and coordinate uh, a lie, like she helped do with the Trump Tower memo, uh, you know, back in 2017? I, I really wait and hope to see that she played the right role and that she's going to be straight with the press special counsel and not cover for the president. Well, we'll see. I mean, uh, how Hope Hicks told that story of the meeting at best was naive, at worst was complicit. And as she looks for her next move, possibly in the corporate world, you've got to wonder, what is corporate America going to say when they say, hold on, you got involved in that whole mess, it's not over and done with, and then you went back? Strange. Hey, MSNBC fans, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down there and click on any of the videos here to watch the latest interviews and highlights. You can get more MSNBC for free every day with our newsletters. Just visit msnbc.com newsletters to sign up now.